Hey, listen, um, we're going to get back into our series, 1 Corinthians, and what we're dealing with is a church that was going through difficult times. I don't know if you guys ever have experienced problems with people. No. Okay. So we're getting into that. And so, and actually next week, we're going to talk about sex. Now I got your attention. <laughs> and we're not going to talk about it because I want to talk about it. It's because the Bible talks about it. We're going through the book of 1 Corinthians. The Apostle Paul is dealing with a church that is functioning in all the spiritual gifts. They're doing amazing things, but they're living a dual life. And so we'll be talking about sex next week, what it means to be married, not next week, but in the next part of the series. We're going to be talking about married, single, divorce, the whole thing. It's going to be talking about sex, the whole thing. And it's going to be starting next week. And, and I love it because it talks about it. Sometimes I don't want to talk about certain topics. But when you preach through the Bible by books, you have to hit topics you don't want to talk about. So that's next week. Oh, before I forget, before I get into that, I also want to uh, encourage you all to be praying for our country during this time. Uh, the elections are over. Maybe you're elated or deflated based on what happened. But this is the good news, that Jesus Christ is always on the throne. Not the Democrats or Republicans. Our identity is not wrapped up in a political party. Remember that, everybody. And so we have to speak truth. Never compromise your values because of your political party. We have to speak to the political parties. We got to pray for those in authority over us, and we have to speak to it. Amen? So, all right, now the Bible says, first of all, I urge men and women to pray everywhere for those in authority over us. So I want to take a few moments to go ahead and do that in a time of division. So, Father, we thank you for the United States of America. We thank you for our country. We thank you for the freedoms we have to live in this country. And Father, we thank you that we're able to be here today. Lord, we are praying that you would continue to bless the Biden administration, Father, as they have to finish up their term by the end of the year, by January 20th. And, Father, we also praying that you'd bless the, the uh, Trump administration as it comes in. Lord, we are praying that we would model what it looks like to be good citizens, Father, that we do not identify with the political party, we, but we identify with the kingdom of heaven. Father, I pray we'd speak, we have courage to speak the truth in love to those in, the par, those in authority, Father, and that we'd be good men and women. And Lord, that we would model what it looks like for people to get together and make a difference of Jesus Christ and not political parties. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, let's get back to what we're talking about. So there are a lot of divisions, kind of like today, right? A lot of divisions going on. And what was happening in many ways, Pastor Randy did a great job last week talking about it. He started chapter 4. We're going to continue. You want to open your Bibles to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 4. And this is, the, this is the issue. All of us want to get it right in life, right? We all want to do well. Who doesn't want to do well in life? We all want to do well. I don't care if you're in junior high. You want to be known as someone who's important. If you're in senior high or, or high school, you want to be seen as someone that is not a fool but is cool, right? Let's be honest. We want to go to the right college, get the right job, and, and so we all want to get it right. And then when you're in college, you, you want to have the right major, you want to find the right person, you want to be seen as someone that's important. And, and sometimes it's tough. Do I measure up to those around me? And as your you're, as you're death's scrolling, it seems like everyone else is getting ahead and you're not. It seems like everyone has a date on a Friday night and you're faking it. Oh, I don't know what you're going through. Or maybe when then you graduate and, or maybe you have a job and, uh, and you want to find someone to marry or maybe not, maybe someone to bury. I don't know. But you, you want to get married and you're trying to do that and everyone else is, you come to church on Sunday, everyone's paired off. You get out of your car, even the squirrels are, are together, going up a tree together. You're like, well, what is going on with me? I want to do well. You know, when you're, you get married, and all of a sudden you get married, and, and you're in an apartment, and a person buys a brand new house, and they got babies, and you can't get pregnant, and, and you're struggling. Or maybe your kids are out of the house, and, and you're excited. The kids are out of the house, but they keep coming back. <laughs> or maybe you're retired, and you still have to work because you can't measure up. Meanwhile, your friends are doing well, and they have grandkids. And, and all these things can happen. We're just trying to measure up. We want to do well. We don't want to be seen as successful. You go to a high school reunion of 40 years, and you want to go back and show you've got something for yourself, and you're embarrassed to go, or you lie, or a person that I knew had some friends visit him from the old country, and he wanted to rent a, he wanted to rent a larger house and rent a Mercedes to show his friends he's doing well. Is that what life's all about? Trying to keep up appearances, 
trying to look successful, trying to convince others that you're successful. It's just not a place you want to be, right? It's misery. That's absolute misery, and it happens in churches. And, and they say, well, we like the Apostle Paul is the real guy, or we like Apollos. Apollos is, he's educated. Or Peter, or no, 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 I got Jesus. And Renny was talking about that last week. He did a great job with that. All these different people that they're trying to be like, right? I want to be like this person. And we find this, almost this competitiveness that's going on. And, and, and it happens all the time. And, and people would say, well, I have this, I have the other. And the Apostle Paul saying, hey, guys, don't you realize nothing you have is from yourself? It's from God. Why are you bragging? It's almost like a bratty, a bratty teenager that has living on dad's money. You know, they got the G-Wagon, AMG, can I hear? A-A-M-G, right? They're dressing in the greatest threads. They're doing really well. And it's all about daddy's money or mommy's money. If they didn't have that, they would have nothing. Do you realize if it was not for God, we'd have nothing? And we, we celebrate things that are not even things that we gave. You know, God gave you talents. God gave you ability. God gave you intellect. And if it wasn't for God, you'd have nothing. And so sometimes we're like spoiled kids. That's not what God has for us. God has something so much better for us. And so here the Apostle Paul, and now is before he gets into sex, he's getting their attention. He said, hey, guys, chapter 5 is sex. You can go there ahead of time. Don't go there now. Okay? You guys are really, like, uptight. Can you loosen up a little bit? I'm telling you the truth. And so what he's doing is he's talking to the church here. And he's, he's telling them what's going on. There's so many things going on. So much division. So much anointing. So much annoying. Sometimes it's hard to tell between the anointing and the annoying. Some people call the annoying the anointing, and it's not. And so here he is talking. Let's get right into it right now in this whole issue. He says this. He's writing to the Corinthian church. I do not write, by the way, he's writing this. You can see the history of this in chapter 18 of Acts. This is about five years after uh, he was there in Acts chapter 18, we believe. And the Apostle Paul is writing to a place with modern day uh, Turkey is. He goes on to follow. He says, I do not write these things to shame you, but as beloved children, I warn you, for though you might have 10,000 instructors in Christ, yet you do not have many fathers. What does that mean? The, the, the Greek word for instructors there is something that people would have these slaves, and slaves were pretty cheap back in those days. 60% of the population was in slavery, or you would get like a nanny to watch your kids, to pick the kids up at the camel stop when they get back from school. They would, they would take them back home. They, they would clean the house, watch after the kids. Don't you wish we had that today? Yeah. So that's what they would do. And they were instructors, and they were helping the kids out. That's the same Greek word for that, but he's not necessarily meaning that. He's saying, basically, you have 10,000 instructors in Christ. And today, we have more than 10,000. All you have to do is go on YouTube, and you can hear the best preaching you've ever heard, far better than I could ever do. You can hear a worship that would just amazing worship with the most gifted and anointed worship leaders, and you can go to the Apple store, and you can get these $3,500 headset to put on you and go into a virtual reality and be in the middle of a Taylor Swift concert. I'd rather not. But seriously, you can, you can have the greatest teaching, the greatest music, and if we're just consumers and we're trying to find something, but the problem is there's no life in it. Because, you know, you and I are made for community. You are God, you and I are made to have in, uh, relationships. And he says that you have 10,000 instructors in Christ, yet you do not have many fathers. What does a father do? What does a mother do? They speak to the children. They help raise the kids, right? So I can be entertained by many things on the internet, great things, not even bad things. And so I, I just want to go with the, the anointing. Is I want to go to the greatest, greatest music and the greatest, coolest pastor and the coolest church. And there's great churches in the area. We thank God other churches are growing. But it's not about that. It's about there's no fathers. What does a father do? What does a mother and father do? The Bible says faithful are the wounds of a friend, but an enemy's kisses are profuse. You see, I, I don't want accountability. I just want to do my own thing. And then during covid we really got into the, the, our little silos of isolation, right? We Netflix binge and watch all the Planet of the Apes movies. Can I hear an amen? 
and we watch all these movies and watch all these videos and we're scrolling all the time. Listen, I do it too. I start scrolling. I laugh. I enjoy myself. I'm by myself. Shh, quiet, quiet. My family's right there with me. I'm telling them to shh. Then the kids do that and I go crazy. My wife goes, um, <clears throat> you do the same thing. Okay. So you're sitting there scrolling through it, but there's no relationship. You see, what it's like is all these sermons and this worship is like chewing gum. You can constantly put chewing gum in your mouth, and it tastes good. You're chewing on it. It tastes good. You blow bubbles, but you're getting no nutrition because there's something that's not really working in your spirit. You and I are built for relationships. In fact, there's been studies done. This is amazing. I was reading about it. I didn't believe it at first, but I doubled and triple teched it. That do you realize that your heartbeat? Of course, I don't know if you realize this, but your heart is beat by electric by electricity, and your, and your mind gives electric impulses, and your, your heart will beat. It has a certain rhythm, and it communicates. And according to studies, a growing body of evidence that another person can sense your heartbeat from 10 feet away. That there, there is an interaction that happens when you and I are together. For example, in, in Romania, a number of years ago, they had this orphanage, and they had all these people that had no parents, and these babies were in these cribs, and they were trying to take care of them all, and they would try to feed them and change them the best they could, but they couldn't hold them in their arms. And some babies were dying. And they couldn't figure out the reason why, after an autopsy, there was nothing wrong with the child except for one major thing. It had no physical connection. We're not designed for digital connections without the physical. You need to sense someone's heartbeat. You need to have someone that you can see, not just on FaceTime, not just on Instagram or Nogram or Whosegram. I'm talking about face-to-face -face communication. We're not designed to be isolated. We're not designed to live a life by ourselves. We do not do well. Why do you think there's an epidemic of suicidal thoughts? Why is there an epidemic of anxiety and depression? Because we've isolated ourselves from God's design that just for interaction with each other... Number one, but number two, the most important should be number one, is you're not connected to God. The author and the creator of your life. All of us want to meet, make something out of our lives. We have a desire to be known. We have a desire to multiply. We have a desire to expand. This is all good. From the very beginning in the Garden of Eden, God said, be fruitful and multiply. Before sin even happens, he says, I want you to name the animals. I want you to expand my created order. So it's always been God's DNA for humanity to advance, to do well. And so God wants you to advance. God wants you to do well, but not just for yourself. You see, when you live for yourself, what happens is you start cannibalizing your own spirit. When you live for yourself, you start cannibalizing yourself. You're not designed to live for yourself. You're designed to live for God. And when you live for God, you truly can become the man and the woman you're called to become. So he's saying, though you have 10,000 instructors, yet you had no many fathers. And he says, I was a father to you. Look at what he says here. For, for in Christ Jesus, I had begotten you through my swift preaching. No. Through my anointed teaching. No. Through what? The gospel. What's the gospel? It's the gospel is Jesus Christ dying on the cross, rising from the dead. That's the gospel of Jesus Christ that you can come in communication with. It. Listen, I know these other slicksters out there that are out there that are so impressive. You love them. You're on the webcast. You even give to the ministry, but they don't know who you are. They don't know what's going on in your life. He says, I birthed you in the gospel. And the apostle Paul is saying, listen, these other people, you have all these, but you have no fathers. And I'd say right now, we're a fatherless society in regards to spiritual, spiritual maturity and a motherless society spiritually. We need to help each other to grow. We're not called to be isolated. There's been studies already. The Bible's talked about this for thousands of years ago. And now we know how unhealthy it is. You know, he goes on in Galatians 4.19, a parallel passage, says this, my little children, he calls them. For whom I labor and birth again until Christ is formed in you. He says, I labor and birth that Christ is formed in you. Now, guys, how many people know you really can't be friends with your kids? You really can't until they're 30 years old or 25 and they're out of the house. Now, when they're young, it's fantastic. When they're three or four years old, Daddy, 
they all run and jump on top of you. You think you're a rock star. It feels awesome. It's, it's fantastic. And then all of a sudden, estrogen comes in and testosterone comes in, and they don't care about you anymore. That's when it's time to buy a dog. Because <laughs> at least the dog will appreciate your home. If you buy a cat, it will hiss at you and scratch you. So, but seriously, I mean, it's like, right? And people try so hard to be friends with their kids. You can't be friends with your kids. You got to be their a loving father or mother. Sometimes a father has to say something, a mother has to say something to the kids. They do not want to hear. And yet we want to be friends. And this is how we are spiritually. I don't want them telling me what to do. I do whatever I want to do. And if I don't like what they're saying at that church, I'll go to the next one. I didn't like that song today. I'm going to the other place. And it's all about consumerism. It's all about what? We all become consumers. Consume, consume. We all become takers. It's never enough. Instead of being producers, it's better to give than to, re- it's better to give than receive, the Bible says. So my little children in whom I labor and birth again until Christ is formed in you. That's our objective here at Cornerstone. We're like, I, we can grow to be thousands of people, but God, are we really helping people grow in Jesus Christ? We want to see you get connected. And what the apostle Paul would do is start a church and he'd find faithful men and women to train the other ones so they could grow in Christ. He'd find the older women would train the younger women and the older men would train the uh, younger men and it would work together. They uh, They would be accountable to each other and they would grow. That's what it means to be a parent. You can't, you can't, um, subcontract your kids to someone else to raise. And can I give you a little advice? You can't subcontract your kids to find God in church. That's our job as parents. We should be extra, like vitamins. You can't live on vitamins. It's extra, right? So my little children in whom I labor and birth again until Christ is formed in you. We want to see Christ formed in you. Our objective is not to make you dependent upon us. Pastor, feed me, feed me, feed me. My name is Jimmy. Give me, give me, give me. No, our job is to get you off of relying upon great teaching and music. Our objective is to get you off the milk and teach you to read the word of God yourself where you can eat daily. And a Sunday becomes like a family meal where we all come together. It's the gravy of the week. But many of us rely upon Sunday morning or a podcast or YouTube video or some kind of uh, music on Spotify or Apple iTunes. It's anointed worship. We don't know how to get there ourselves. I want to go and be fed. And we walk around, and it's sad. The Apostle Paul said, he said, by now you should be teaching others, but I have to give you milk. So our job really is, is to become irrelevant in that regard. Our job is to help train you. And so, Lord, what can we, I'm asking the Lord, Lord, what can we do? We want to do a better job at it, Lord. We don't want, just want to entertain people and hope they don't go someplace else. You know, and that's not what it's about. But this is what was going on. They're like, the apostle Paul, please, he's so yesterday news. I like the other guy over here. He's cooler. And that's what was going on. He says, I anguish into crisis form you. Uh, The job of a parent, hopefully, eventually, your kids can become your friends. But this is why we need to have the hard conversations. Hold each other accountable. Now, here's something the apostle Paul says, which is amazing. He says this, therefore, I urge you to imitate me. It's like, do what I do. Whoa. And I don't know, I, I've noticed this. Sometimes I get agitated by things, right? And I, I have children that are sitting right over there. I'm not going to put them on the spot. I'm not going to recognize that they're there. But <laughs> sometimes I'll do something. They'll do something that irritates me. I mean, big time. My wife goes, <clears throat> they're just imitating you. And when they do something amazing, they're imitating Sandra. Okay? You got that clear? But they start, they they, they do what I do. Uh Uh-oh, right? He says, I urge you to imitate me. But look what he says later on to bring more clarification. He says this, imitate me just as I what? Imitate Christ. The apostle Paul was abundantly clear. Do not copy me the moment I'm not following Jesus. Don't follow me. He said it very clearly. If an angel were to come down, don't follow me. Follow me as I follow Christ. And so that's what I want to do as a pastor. And listen, this is part of the issue. One of the blessings I have about being a pastor here is I have to get up here and speak to you about Jesus, and I don't want to be a hypocrite. Therefore, if I have any problems during the week, I need to solve it by Sunday. (laughs) 
Some of you never clean your house until you have small groups. Hurry up, clean the house. I know somebody that hired a maid, and they clean the house before the maid comes. You guys aren't laughing, so you do it. Okay. He says, imitate me just as I imitate Christ. And so we want to be examples, right? And so it's really a blessing because it, it causes me to sacrifice my own needs and wants to be a blessing to my family and to be a blessing to you, right? And it requires me to have responsibility and sacrifice. Responsibility and sacrifice and giving make a life worth living. When it's all about consuming, it will consume you from the inside out. Imitate me just as I imitate Christ, wow. That takes relationship. You see, the problem is, you and I rather follow the kingpin than the king. That's my Uncle Louie right there. <laughs> We're supposed to follow the king, not the kingpin. i got my Uncle Louie, and you know about him, right? Hey, Pastor Eric, what can I do for you? Okay, this guy, um, this guy's giving me a hard time. What is his address? 15 Conifer Drive. I'll take care of it. I won't tell you a thing. And then you find him at the bottom of the Naugatuck River with cement shoes. <laughs> But I'm just joking, though my grandfather was in the mafia. But this kingpin thing, it's all about the kingpin. The pastors can become king, kingpins. They can. Movements in the church, all about that. No, it's about the king, not the kingpins. It's not about a different movement. Oh, this church is anointing. This ministry is great. The Episcopals are the way to go. It's the quiet home church where there's no buildings, nothing. Oh, no, it's the ones that have the cathedrals where there's a reverence. You go in there, there's a reverence. Oh, no, no, you need, you need trapeze artists and people climbing poles in churches and swallowing swords, which happened, by the way. Don't look it up. Yes. No, that's not what we need. What we need is Jesus Christ and him crucified, right? So this is what happens. See, we do not dare to classify or compare ourselves with some who commend themselves. When they measure themselves by themselves and compare themselves with themselves, they're not wise. Like, for example, the whole society is going down in its moral codes. And as long as I'm floating on top of it, rest, then better than the rest of society, I'm okay. See, here's the problem. I'm a guitar player, and so I like to play guitar. And so imagine if I'm up here leading worship for about two months, and I don't have a tuner. I just tune based upon why. Okay, I tune my low E to the rest of the strings, standard tuning. And I tune, and then the whole band tunes to me. And this goes on for months. But I never tuned, I even tuned the piano to my guitar. Everything's tuned to my guitar. Now, what happens is there's a standard called 440. It's where we, we that's the 440 is how we tune everything. So if someone comes in from another place and says, you're not in tune. I'm in the key of D. We're supposed to be in the key of E. I'm in a totally different, I have a dissonance. So God has a standard tuning in heaven. And we don't tune ourselves based upon what your tune is. It's Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ. The problem, has, the problem has happened is we tune ourselves based upon each other. This is why we had a society that owned and abused slaves in America. This is why we had racism in America. This is why we've had all sorts of horrendous things in our culture that the church turned a blind eye towards because our standard was not the Lord Jesus Christ. It was what each other was doing. It's a recipe for destruction. So we do not dare to classify, compare ourselves with some who commend themselves when they measure themselves by themselves or compare themselves with themselves. I mean, nothing good. Comparing leads to despairing. It does. Nothing good comes out of comparing. Maybe I'll compare myself to yesterday, but even that's not. God is my standard, not my neighbor, not the podcaster, not the guy that has an, the, the guy with the big church or small church, not the guy with the rich church who flies around on a jet, not the guy who goes around on a pinto. It doesn't make a difference. My standard is the Lord Jesus Christ is yours as well. Comparing leads to despairing. Either you'll think you're better than somebody else, or you'll feel like trash, or you won't care. All of us despair. We should be helping each other, encourage each other to run greater than we could before. You see, what the Apostle Paul did, 
In the next verse, he says this, for this reason, I have sent Timothy to you. Why? He's raising these children in the Lord. I care about my kids. I'm going to make sure they get trained by someone, my own son, Timothy. And my friends, you and I need to be on the lookout that wherever God's placed you, we need to find someone we can encourage in the Lord. And we need to find someone that they can help mentor us. We mentor someone below us and someone alongside of us. Those are the three relationships that you and I should really be in. That brings growth to us, right? For this reason, I've sent Timothy to you, who's my beloved, faithful son. Listen to that. He calls him a son in the Lord who will remind you of, of my ways in Christ as I teach everywhere in every church. You see, now some are what? Puffed up. Oh, we got the best of the best. Oh, we at our church, we gave $25,000 to the people. What did you give? I gave $2 million. Oh, that's great. Uh, you know, I, I, this happens to me. I go to a pastor's meeting, right? And they ask, the pastor's meetings are funny. It's just like a sales meeting. He said, how you doing? My name's Eric. How many are you running? And Pastor Tom taught me this one. Pastor Tom said, people ask me how many I'm running. I say, I'm running them all. How many are running? I'm running them all. Because you want to size someone else up. Oh, I'm better. Let me go with the people that have the larger church or the smaller church. Guys, this happens among, past, I hate to tell you. We compare ourselves to other people. I thank God that Elevate Life is doing well. I thank God that Vox Church is growing. I thank God for Black Rock Church is growing. I thank God for the one over there. I can't remember the name of it anymore. Sorry. But I, I thank God when churches are growing anywhere for that matter, right? Praise God. Praise God. I think it's fantastic. I think it's fantastic that churches are doing, thank God that New Life is church is doing well. We love the New Life in Trouble. I could go on and on about all these churches that are doing very well. Praise God for that, right? We're not competing. We're completing each other. They can reach people we can't reach and vice versa. And so if we start competing against each other, how stupid is that? But that's what happens among pastors. Of course, you guys are not that way. You're more mature than the pastors. But some of our puffed up as though I were not coming to you. They're puffed up in themselves. What the Bible says about that. But knowledge puffs up. But love builds up. When it's all about what I can do and how much I know and how much I own, who I am, look at the job I have, look at the school I have, look at the friends I have, look at the car I'm driving, look at the clothes I'm wearing, look where I'm retiring to, oh, look at all these things I have. I know this, I know the other, and you're all puffed up. But the problem is like a paper mache boulder. All it takes is a pin, pop. In a moment's notice, you could be dead. Yet, love builds up. And when love builds up, nothing can break it. It's a boulder of God's strength in your life. When the pins of life try to, try to take the air out of your life, they can touch nothing. As the great prophet M.C. Hammer said, can't touch this. <laughs> but knowledge puffs up while love builds up. Listen, what would happen when you meet somebody, instead of saying, mm, I wonder what they think about me. Am I good looking enough? Am I smart enough? Is my church as large as the other pastor's church? Or uh, do I, my kids, how about this? Gee, I wonder how they're doing. How can I bless them? How can I encourage them? How can I light a fire? How can I throw another piece of wood in the fire of their heart to encourage them? How can I be a blessing to this person? How can I show the love of Christ? If that is your, your, your goal, you know what that does? It sets you free. The enemy, the demons are like, trash. I can't, the, the, the demons are like, I can't do nothing. I can't touch this. MC Hammer, I can't touch him. Because he's reaching out to other people. He's being a blessing to somebody else. He wants to see their betterment over himself. He actually is excited when someone does better than him because the gospel is going forward. I know how freeing that is. But they got into college and they have a free ride. My kids can barely go to Nogatuck Valley. Praise God. Nothing wrong with Nogatuck Valley. They have a lot of money. Why not rejoice with your rejoice, right? And cry with those who cry. But knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. How much better is that, everybody? Do you want to live in a fake life? Do you want to be nothing? I mean, there's some people that look like they have their whole life together on Instagram. I mean, it's amazing. Everything is beautiful. They look beautiful. Everything's perfect. Thank God for the filters. <laughs> they even have AI now. I can take a picture of my face and it put me in a beautiful suit. I can even record myself and I can start talking without me even talking. It's insane what's happening. You can fake it real big time this year, but you know what happens? You're going to be hollow inside because you're made for relationship with God in each other. He says this, he says, but I will come to you shortly. 
if the Lord wills. We're going to build this church. We're going to start a school. We're going to do this. We're going to do the other. No, I'm going to do this if the Lord wills. If the Lord allows it, we should always have the idea if God will allow us to do this, we will do it. And we don't say it in a religious, snarky way. We literally need God in order to do God's work. But I will come to you shortly if the Lord wills it. And I, and I will know not the word of those who are puffed up, but the power. You see, we don't come with mere words. We come with power. Deutimus, the actual where we get the word dynamite from. God wants to give us power in his authority. Not so we can lay hands on the sick and they recover. That's good. Not so we can prophesy. That's good. Not that we have anointed worship and anointed preaching. That's good. But that people come to know Jesus Christ. Their hearts are changed. Their marriages are healed. They know Christ, right? Even if you get healed of cancer and you don't give your life to Christ, what good is it? So for a long time, we've been running after the power gifts. I'm the power team, and I'm going to outdo this. We have more anointing than you have. The anointing becomes annoying. I don't want the annoying. I want the anointing, and the anointing is the building up of Christ. Signs and wonders are the purpose is to bring people to Jesus, not for signs and wonders. Oh, he was so anointed. Who cares? Did they come to Jesus? Do, do you follow me, everybody? I'm not saying we're, not, we're against spiritual. We're not against spiritual. In fact, we're going to talk about spiritual guests, all nine of them. That's part of the book of, of, of 1 Corinthians. We're going to get the spiritual gifts. God wants all that. But if we have not love, it means nothing. What does love have to do with it? Everything. You see, when I come to you shortly, if the Lord wills, I, and I will know not the word of those who are puffed up, but the power. You see, for the kingdom of God is not of words. How talented you are. How eloquent you, and by the way, how anointing you are. Do you know the Bible says, Jesus says, many will come to him in that day say, Father, we prophesied in your name. We cast out demons in your name. You need to go like this way. He's going to say this. Get away from me. I don't even know who you are. Just because you have a psychic healing, just because someone gives you a word doesn't mean they're of God. Do you follow me, everybody? We don't worship the gifts. We worship the gift giver, and that's God. For the kingdom of God is not of word, but in power. He goes on to say, I said, what do you want? Shall I come to you with a rod or in love and a spirit of gentleness? See, the apostle Paul cares enough to say the hard words. Is there anyone in your life that can speak hard words that's not trying to tear you down? I, perp I actually, you know what I found out? I've seen a lot of pastors and a lot of ministries fall. This is what I found out. Unless you're willingly to voluntarily to make yourself accountable, it's not going to work. So I literally go out of my way to find people that hold me accountable. I have someone hold me accountable how I run the church. I have someone hold me accountable on my spiritual disciplines. I have someone accountable with uh, how I am sexually and I'm being pure. I, I, have to, I have to search these things out. Why? Because I want to be everything God's called me to be, and I can't do it by myself. We need each other, everybody. You see, he says, shall I come to you to rod or in love or spirit of gentleness? So what do we need to apply today? What do we do? Well, follow the king, not the kingpin. Can we do that, everybody? I don't care how great something is. Follow the king, not the kingpin. Comparing leads to despairing. It really does. Stop comparing yourself to other churches, other people, other marriages, how they look. I can't believe she's 40. She looks like she's 20. Only on Facebook. <laughs> And, you know, you see, and here's another one. You see, the role of teachers versus fathers. You can't be a teacher. You see, a teacher is instruct, but fathers in, invest relationally. Are you investing in anyone relationally? First of all, let me say something very important. Number one priority is you and God. Second priority, if you're married or have family, is your family. Third priority is those in the church. Why? Let me explain. If you can't do it here, you can't do it out there. The Bible says, Father, let them love each other as you and I love each other, that the world would know that I was sent. When the world sees a functioning, biblically run community, they say, I want that. Out of that strength, out of that practice, we go out there and make a difference simultaneously. That's what God 
would have for us. You see, teachers instruct, but fathers invest relationally. Fathers are givers, not takers. I can't understand for me. I've known people that get jealous of their kids. I, I frankly don't understand that. If my children do better than me, I ain't going to be so happy. Unless they, no, I'm just kidding. I'll, 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 <laughs> no, seriously, I, I want my kids to do, I want you to do better than me. I, I want the next pastor, whenever I leave, I'm not here forever. I want him or her to, to, be, the, to be amazing. Right? I want God to do great things. It's not about me. Our job is to help the next person. Fathers are givers and not takers. And you're always trying to extract. The more you extract, the more you're going to be hollow inside. You're, literally, it's like cannibalism. The more you give, the more you receive. You see, this is something I want to just for a few seconds mention to you. There's two types of people in the world, generally speaking, or two types of Christians. They're giver. Christians and taker Christians. I don't want to be a, a taker. I want to be a giver. Now, I want to receive with thanksgiving. See, God wants us to be like a river, a raging river. A raging river has water running into it, running through it and going to the other side, right? That's, that's where life is. But when you, when you start becoming a consumer, you know what happens? You get scum on you called pond scum. Remember the eighth grade, the paramecium? You get that stagnant water in your life, it doesn't work very well. Or you're like the Dead Sea in Israel, where what happens is it has everything running into it, but it has nothing running out of it. It becomes disease. The church becomes disease when we live for ourselves. You become disease when you live for yourself. The best way to have a meaningful life is to love God, to receive the Spirit, and let the Spirit flow through you. Freely you have given, freely you receive, now freely give. Our job is to take the blessings that God has given us and pass it along. If God can entrust you to give to others, he'll give you more, not to spend it on yourself. And that's real living. It's called sacrifice. Boy, you guys are really help. You guys are a hard crowd today. I don't need it. But you can help me preach a little bit. Let me know you're getting this, because this is good. It's the word of God. For the kingdom of God is not in word, but in dudamus. You see, if the spirit ain't flowing, you're not growing. It's not about, not by might, not by power, but by my spirit. We have to invite the Holy Spirit in us. We still got to do our work, but we have to invite the Spirit of God in us to flow. You see, follow the king, not the kingpin. Comparing leads to despairing. If the Spirit isn't flowing, you're not growing. Do you have the Spirit of God flowing in you? Or is it all about me, me, me? And we're called to multiply. I'm going to ask you to bow your heads for a second. Father, we just thank you so much for this opportunity, Lord, to come here together. Lord, we want to be a strong church. We want to be a strong people. Lord, deliver us from comparing ourselves to other people. Lord, deliver us from the despairing of comparing. Deliver us, Father, for trying to follow the kingpin instead of following you, our king. Lord, we want to see you realized in our lives. Father, would you set us free of living a hollow life Father, we realize only what we do for you lasts forever. Father, I thank you for these great men and women that are here today and those watching in line. I ask your anointing to be upon them, Father, that we would be a strong church, a growing church that's accountable to each other, that grows together, that goes together and makes a difference in the world. Father, deliver us from mediocrity. Deliver us from a consumer mentality. Let us be givers and receivers in Jesus' name.